Hello and welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2021 and I can't believe I'm saying this but this is our penultimate session brought to you in partnership with our platinum sponsors Intopia, Fable, TPGI Art and Adobe and our gold sponsor Tetralogical. If you haven't already you can follow us on Twitter at id24conf, id24conf and if you have questions for our presenter, Ross, then please do tweet them using the ID24 hashtag so that we can ask them at the end of the session. I'm delighted to be joined by our guest host, Sarah Higley, who is doing her second session for today. That is dedication indeed. And she will be introducing our next presenter. Over to you, Sarah. Hi, thanks, Annie. Um, our next presenter is Ross Mullen, and he is talking about something that I know a number of people have told me they're interested in already, uh, and it's the next step and beyond using screen readers to evaluate the compatibility of a website. Over to you, Ross. Thanks, Sarah. I'm a real stickler for accuracy, but I've always found screen reader testing advice something unusual, where there are so many blogs and articles about how to test with a screen reader, describing which commands to use to interact with the content on the page, but very little on how to actually test, which elements to test, and how to interpret results. The more I've looked into attempting to understand other approaches with screen reader testing, the more it hasn't really made sense. I like accuracy and consistency when uh, testing, and I like being able to recreate a test with a consistent methodology. Yet screen reader testing felt, to me at least, from these articles, that it isn't something which can be documented easily. Instead, you need to get a feel for it. The intention these blogs gave of uh, getting a feel for testing with, uh, with a screen reader always sat awkwardly with me. I wasn't sure what I was testing, and if I'm honest, I only ever used the tab key to navigate through several interactive components and thought that, well, it sounds okay. I wasn't interacting with the page content in any consistent way. I wasn't systemizing the, the testing. It was at best a cursory test. Looking back at the past results, it's clear that this wasn't a great approach to testing with a screen reader. If the test can't be repeated consistently, then it's not a good test. But I was doing what I thought was best, and I was being, uh, being uh, guided by good intention blogs. Over time, however, reading blogs from the web accessibility community and going deeper into the subject, it began, began to dawn on me that the often quoted advice of be sure to test with a screen reader whilst good intention is fundamentally flawed. This path towards identifying a better approach to screen reader testing took shape in an organization where I was formalizing a lot of the testing process. The overall accessibility maturity was very low and the challenge was trying to enforce a consistent approach on making the web apps being produced accessible. There was always a huge intention to make the digital services accessible, but it unfortunately often became tokenistic. But testing against the WCAG 2.1 had been uh, covered pretty well, but it's the next part called the pub test, which was becoming challenging. For people unfamiliar with the term, it's an Australian term to describe the collective opinion of the average person in the pub, questioning an approach taken. On screen is a scene from The Simpsons where Mr. Burns is being pelted with food and drink whilst the crowd are shouting boo. Could the average person, upon hearing that a website had been made accessible to accessibility guidelines, assume that it would uniformly work on a screen reader? That we had in fact tested it on those devices. 
websites were being consistently made conformant to WCAG. Great. However, if a user had found it didn't work with the screen reader JAWS, what possible response could we provide other than, well, it's been built to WCAG? That never sat well with me. We were building to a technical standard, but were not in any way performing any tests with the same devices users have. We weren't testing closer to the real world experience. All the articles I had been reading were so often centered on the instruction of how to use a screen reader to navigate headings, how to use a screen reader to navigate lists. It didn't make sense to try and document a process of loading up a website, press the H key in MBDA, traverse through all the headings on the page, and then what? You've identified there are headings on a page. You repeat the process again and traverse all the links on the page and you've identified the page has links you think the link the link text sounds right is that that the test these tests i feel are only ever making a user become more familiar with navigating a website with a screen reader there are really no actionable insights to be gained so many blogs are describing detail insights some of which are maybe trivial of screen reader testing explaining how a developer found a word is mispronounced by a screen reader and then using this as the justification to demonstrate that screen reader testing is valuable i'm not saying identifying mispronounced the content is not important because it clearly is but is it really that important in the overall scheme of things? I had this internal conflict of, on the one hand, thinking identifying mispronounced the content is helpful, but equally, if a user can't perform an end-to-end -end workflow, then nothing is really progressing, and we're not really understanding how to make the UI better. We're simply performing screen reader theater. The act of thinking we're doing good and uncovering problems when really we're not. What changed for me was a blog post from a test analyst at UK UX consultancy Nexa. The test analyst described the testing with mobile devices and the article moved beyond the often repeated statement of pressing a specific key in a screen reader to traverse a, a, a specific element. It was focused a lot more on the outcome of the test. Test element X, listen for its outcome. And this to me was the beginning of something which made sense. It finally began addressing the how and what to test. Test element X by navigating to it and record its output. It feels very obvious in hindsight, but here was an article describing a process which produced an outcome which can be acted upon, which aligned more with my quest for certainty and consistency. I've previously attempted to gauge how others in the accessibility community would test with a screen reader. Some people would say they would test every HTML element on the page or headings or lists, form controls, all the way down to actual text content. But this approach never really sat well with me. Static native HTML, that is HTML elements which don't do anything except to act as, as scaffolding for text content is already well supported in browsers and and screen readers when used correctly and built to the HTML specification. If you're testing a native list element, you're, you're testing that the list element renders correctly in a browser and is interpreted by a screen reader. That's not screen reader testing, that's compatibility you're testing. Based on these thoughts, a process for how I would perform screen reader testing was beginning to take shape. 
I focused on the capability of the, of the screen reader and on audible output of web content. And from this, I set several principles which shaped my approach to screen reader testing. Point one, native web content is already well supported by browsers and screen readers. Point two, user varia is, is a, a, a brittle and can fail at the implementation on the browser and screen reader support stage. And point three, CSS can affect the display of native HTML in screen readers. But I still had doubt creeping in. I put myself in the shoes of an organization. If I was wanting to understand how accessible my organization's website is with a screen reader, wouldn't I want to, want to expect to know how the site performs on a range of browsers and, and screen readers? Would the test being performed be sufficient? Wouldn't I want to know all the possible permutations where my content can and does fail? Would I want that? Ultimately, I answered to this no. I believe the focus of screen reader testing should be on a user being able to complete a workflow, the outcome of the user's actions. Navigational waypoints and static HTML content serve to help the user to understand the content and provide context. I believe the workflow a user must traverse to reach an outcome is more important and far more valuable for understanding how and if a user can navigate a site. The outcome could be placing an item in the shopping cart, signing up for an account or logging into a dashboard literally anything beyond basic page navigation. I, I believe it's futile to test every single component and element on a page. There is little actionable insights to be gained from, uh, from testing a list element or heading element or a text content through a screen reader, where it can only ever be created a limited number of ways. So principle one, there is less to go wrong when using simple native HTML elements. It's well supported. This formed the second part of the principles. Beyond native HTML, which is well supported, complex componentry built, with, built using REA attributes and a range of div and span elements has a range of problems from how they're often built in incorrectly and not in line with established authoring guidelines to the level of support screen readers and browsers provide interpreting them. Ordinarily, native HTML is well supported. Buttons and links natively provide screen reader feedback out of the box. Hard page reloads uh, give cues to the screen reader that something has changed on screen. This support, however, begins to break down when complex components are created using ARIA attributes, things which can't ordinarily be performed using native HTML. And the final principle was CSS can change the way content is interpreted. Applying CSS and ARIA improperly can change the way native HTML is rendered by a screen reader. A native list element can be made hidden to screen readers using the ARIA hidden attribute, or the list elements semantics can be nullified by applying list style none. Nothing has changed semantically. However, with the addition of poorly placed attributes or, uh, or CSS, we've now induced extra unintended behavior which doesn't work well within a screen reader. So based on these principles, the tests began to take shape with uh, testing major navigational elements to, to determine if they sound as they appear. Does a heading which uh, displays something on screen also announce the same thing through the screen reader? Does a link text announce the, the same thing? Basically, does a screen reader output what is being displayed by the headings or links. 
Importantly, I decided to not repeat the test already performed as part of a WCAG testing. I wouldn't be a testing if the headings are nested correctly or if the tab ordering is correct, as these are already carried out earlier. These screen reader tests would occur after a WCAG testing had been carried out and I wasn't duplicating effort and recording those same issues already identified elsewhere. These tests were focused on being closer to the real world experience of a screen reader user. From these three principles, I created seven tests. The first four are related to traversing navigational waypoints and understanding the content, those elements that, that assist a user in navigating around a page. Whilst the remaining three are for interactive for content, the elements which move the user on through the workflow. These tests were number one, the screen reader output matches the visual output of all headings. Number two, the screen reader output matches the visual output of all links as a minimum. Number three, the screen reader output matches the visual output of all list elements. Number four, the screen reader output outputs the first two rows of a table element and announces the columns. Number five, all visual error messages are announced. Number six, all significant page activity is announced. And lastly, number seven, the outcome of all controls is announced. For consistency, these seven tests would be uniformly applied in every screen reader and browser combination. But why is the breadth of screen reader testing equally important? The tests wouldn't be just applied in isolation with one browser and screen reader combination, but with a several. They remove that vague fuzziness with uh, testing with a single, a single screen reader, where you're unsure if it's a problem specific to the screen reader or poor code. Previously, if an error had been identified in JAWS with a Chrome browser, I wouldn't be sure if this was an error of, of the markup or an error of compatibility. Before, we, we wouldn't know. A testing in one browser and one, one screen reader for combination only, we would be coding against the outcome of any unusual behavior. A list element is behaving oddly. Is it Edge? Is it a Firefox? It's most likely an IE11 thing. Let's fix it. But maybe the changes would make the content more accessible. Or maybe it, it's just coding against a particular quirk of the screen reader and browser combination. If we were to continue down this path, we're favoring one browser and one screen reader and coding to the quirks of a particular browser vendor and moving away from the true north of, of WCAG. And we wanted to avoid this and avoid us saying, well, it works in Chrome in response to any difficulties a user may be facing. We want to build to a uniform specification, but also, also document unusual behavior of how that, how that specification is interpreted. When testing across a range of browsers and screen readers, we're now documenting the behavior across multiple combinations. It becomes easier for us to understand if it's a coding error or if it's a compatibility problem. If the unusual behavior just shows up in one combination of screen reader and browser, but works everywhere else, there's now a high degree of confidence. The unusual behavior we've identified is only isolated to that combination. It's probably a combination quirk. Yet if an issue 
occurs across every single browser and screen reader combination where that's clearly pointing to a, a coding a problem. No more guesses, no more uncertainty. These tests are beginning to show us what we can fix and what can be ignored. We're not chasing our, our tails, fixing behavior, which really isn't a problem for us. I'm not saying we should not try to avoid decoding against odd browser and screen reader quirks, but we shouldn't let those quirks be the deciding factors for us drastically altering our content. I assumed a screen reader user would use those HTML elements as navigational waypoints. Headings would be used to orientate themselves on a page and understand the page hierarchy. Links would be used to navigate around the content. Lists display instructions whilst the tables presented tabular data. These were the four static HTML elements that a user would most likely encounter when navigating through a workflow. I'm making assumptions about what a user may do, but these assumptions I believe were reasonable. Although native HTML is well supported, that universal support can be rapidly undone with an errant ARIA hidden attribute or or CSS affecting the display, rendering the visible heading hidden within the screen reader. So we're protesting for the for the equivalent experience in a screen reader. A heading is visually displayed on a page. Is the heading text outputted by a screen reader? The same test is followed with links. Is the link text as a minimum the same as what's shown? I went with as a minimum as use of ARIA label and ARIA labeled by attributes will override the visual text. At the very least, is the visual text the same as the link text described by the screen reader? This was followed by navigating lists. Are the number of list items seen visually the same as what is announced by the screen reader? When testing tables, I only tested the first and the second rows. The first row is often the header row containing uh, columns, whilst the second row contains the table cell data. By navigating just those two rows, we're expecting the screen reader to output the column headings, if correctly marked up, in every uh, table cell, along with the cell data. I decided against the testing the entire table as there really isn't much to gain as it's likely if a table cell is, is coded correctly at the beginning of the table, it will be coded correctly at the end. There isn't much to deviate from. The last three tests were the most challenging to create, but gives the most flexibility for anyone developing screen reader tests to understand or interpret the results. The previous four tests concern the navigational waypoints for the user to understand and orientate the information on the page. These tests comprise of the actions for the user to take completing a workflow. As part of a workflow, errors may be encountered. Users might be required to select an item from a drop-down list or enter a value. We don't need to worry about what the control actually is and what it should be doing. We're just focusing on if there is some user input, and that input is validated, which can result in an error being displayed, ensure the error is outputted by a screen reader. We don't need to worry about these 
specifics of types of error message or which way it's being rendered, as this detail is being addressed by the earlier WCAG tests. This is solely to determine if a visual error message appears, then that error is audibly outputted by the screen reader. A particular challenge of the web today is front-end frameworks and partial page reloads. Something on the page triggers a change and the, and the entire view changes and is replaced with something else. Moving the focus to the heading element or the use of RELI regions to describe the changes orally are some of the techniques to, to fix this. However, regardless of the technique used or applied, we just want to test the visual output by the screen reader. For example, Ajax spinners displaying whilst a page is loading content even though the spinner may be fast and only appears briefly on screen for less than a second, slower connections will affect the performance and can result in the icon being on screen far longer than, at, than anticipated and therefore leave the screen reader user questioning if something is happening. So is this visual change outputted by the screen reader? Is a new page notification outputted by the screen reader? Is any significant page activity described by the screen reader? The last test is directed to controls. Can a control which is interacted with describe its outcome? When I was working out this test, I had originally decided on having specific tests for specific controls. Does an autocomplete control list the number of items returned? Does it announce each item when traversed through its returned results? However, there would be, would be so many tests, each with several combinations that Describing them all would be incredibly difficult and a documentation nightmare. In the end, I went with a, with a test which is a dib, deliberately broad. Is a control's outcome described by the screen reader? The outcome may be collapsing or expanding a content, returning a number of items from an auto-suggest control. Whatever it is, we're expecting the screen reader to describe the output of what we are seeing visually. I spent a lot of time going over these tests, thinking, is there a better way? Can each test be more descriptive? Does it do enough? But ultimately, I settled for something good enough. It's not perfect but I think it balanced the need for clarity with screen media so testing and moves those tests into actionable outcomes. The subsequent instructions then for, for testing with screen readers were then driven by these very the tests. The keyboard navigation moved beyond the rudimentary press the tab key to traverse through interactive content. It used the keys to navigate to specific sections of the content and interact with them. Using voiceover on Mac OS, I would press command plus the H key to move forward through the headings, while shift plus the command key plus H would move would move backwards through the headings. And these instructions were repeated for NVDA, JAWS, TalkBack on Android, and VoiceOver on iOS. The same seven tests were being consistently applied. The only change was documentation of the screen reader navigation. This then resulted in there are several quick start guides describing each test. 
general settings to prepare for the screen reader and which keys to test for when using which tests. It moves the user away from having to think about how to test, what to test, and which keys to use by providing several clear tests. The results have been interesting. Ordinarily, running in one browser and one screen reader, potential problems would, would be noted. But now, with scaling this up, patterns can start to be identified. A previous audit where I applied this methodology showed the browser support for complex controls was uniformly inconsistent. The controls operated poorly in all combinations and that ultimately it was a fault with how the controls had been written. I found complex controls are almost always to blame for large accessibility failures when developing web Web applications, custom functionality is often required. Regular links and buttons don't necessarily provide the support which a team requires, and the team begin building something unique or using a custom control from a vendor tool set where the vendor has said they're accessible. And this is a whole different talk. I always had a gut feeling that the custom controls are problematic. Numerous accessibility audits had, had shown me how fraught it was to build complexity. And even when built correctly, I wasn't certain if the results from a single screen reader were, were a demonstration of how the control should work. This screen reader the testing approach has allowed me to understand the behavior more broadly over several combinations. Is it a code problem or is it a compatibility problem? But let's, let's try it out on an example page. We have a fictional page for a sign-in form, something which is found pretty much uniformly on all complex apps. We identify the workflow understanding what, uh, what the user is trying to accomplish, and this becomes the outcome. In this instance, a user has to navigate the sign-up form, complete it, and log in. Using the screen reader tests, we're now trying to determine the level of compatibility this entire workflow has in a range of browsers and screen readers. We're solely focused on how well the workflow responds within the screen reader MVDA and in the browser Chrome. The first four the tests navigate the page hierarchy. There are two headings on the page, a sign in and sign in help, only one of which is directly related to the workflow goal of signing in, and this is tested. Is the heading sign in? outputted by the screen reader the same way it's displayed. We start MVDA, navigate the heading levels and listen to the output. The heading sounds the same as displayed. That's a tick, the test has passed. There are no links on, there are no links on the page, so we ignore the links test and mark as not applicable. That's also the same with lists and and the table elements, where there are no elements of those type on the page dot directly related to the outcome of user signing in. So we've applied four navigational tests. One of the tests is valid, whilst the three remaining tests don't feature in the workflow. The next three tests navigate the workflow. These tests follow a negative workflow. All errors on form controls are triggered as part of that workflow. There are two sign-in controls, username and password. We enter an incorrect username and a password, click 
submit and to test if the error message shown visually is outputted by the screen reader. The important point here is we're not wanting to navigate around the screen to stumble upon the error, but we wish to encounter the error simply by attempting to submit the sign-in form. If the input data is invalid, the error will be shown and the error message should be announced if it has been created following WCAG 2.1 success criteria and is contained within a live region. In this, in this scenario, the error messages are shown visually but are not outputted by the screen reader and the test fails. The correct username and password are entered and the form is submitted. There, there is no partial page refresh changing significant parts of the content. This test is ignored and marked as not, not applicable. There are no uh, complex controls and this uh, test is also ignored. We then repeat those, those tests again in Edge, Firefox, and IE, IE 11, followed by another screen reader, in this instance, JAWS. Building up a picture of how that workflow performs in, in uh, different combinations. We aren't focusing on the individual com components and how well they perform, but the entire end-to-end -end workflow. Can a user navigating with a screen reader complete the task? Yes, it's a pass or no, it's a failure. It's, it's, it's giving us a measure of the difficulty a user may encounter. On screen, it's a large spreadsheet matrix with the screen readers NVDA, JAWS, VoiceOver and TalkBack laid out horizontally, grouping the browsers Edge, Chrome, Firefox and IE11. Down one side are the elements of the of the web page the web page tested. These being headings, links, lists, tables, errors, activity, and controls. Overwhelmingly, the results show in it in every browser and screen reader combination, headings are outputted correctly with a yes in every cell, whilst error messages aren't outputted by the screen reader by the screen reader in all combinations with a no in every cell and this is pointing to incorrect markup links lists so tables activity and controls all have not applicable in each cell as these weren't identified as part of the workflow this is confirmed by viewing the source code finding where the error message is applied and as suspected, the error message is not marked up as an ARIA live region. It's failed 4.1.3 status messages. This workflow, a test, is a very trivial example and the incorrect code may well have been picked up from manual testing earlier. But the, the screen reader testing is beginning to get closer to the experience a screen reader user encounters. But why not just test with a screen reader user immediately and, and do away with this extra, extra burden and this extra, extra, extra process? Organizations often have limited time and resources or even technical hurdles affecting the ability to share internal working versions by empowering the developers with a rudimentary process of checking the work as they're, uh, as they're going along means accessibility problems, which are most likely, uh, most likely straightforward, are less likely to creep in to the production site. By testing the outcome of a workflow, we're testing to determine if a user can do the task they set out to do, not necessarily focus on the small details which don't contribute to the user reaching their outcome. 
This sort of testing approach is ultimately paired with several other tests. Ensure your uh, testing to a WK a 2.1, your AA criteria correctly. You're performing user acceptance of testing for any complex controls are developed all the way through the testing with users with lived experiences. I've made assumptions to how a user may navigate a screen. I have to balance the absolute certainty of testing every single element and possibly producing documentation and results which don't tell me or a client much or uh, testing a workflow using the HTML elements that a user would most likely interact with. With this approach, I think I, I've done that. It's giving me and us a tangible result. If you're interested in learning more, check out the, the resources on uh, uh, GitHub. Uh, GitHub.com, if you're forward slash uh, Canaxis, C-A-N-A-X-E, double S, a forward slash accessibility hyphen resources, where there are, uh, are several guides for testing with MVDA, JAWS, VoiceOver on iOS, on iOS and macOS, as well as the, uh, the WCAG uh, a 2.1 uh, a AA master for template, which we use in our uh, testing efforts. I've been Ross, I'm, uh, I'm the director of CanAccess. We're a web accessibility consultancy based in uh, Canberra, Australia. We work with lots of interesting teams globally and work with well-known uh, UX and accessibility uh, companies helping increase their accessibility uh, uh, testing capacity. If you're interested in working together and perhaps applying this, this screen reader testing methodology to your, to your apps to see how, how well they perform with screen readers, we'd love to have a chat. Reach out to us at hello at canaxis.com.au, Twitter at Mr. Ross Mullen, and our website at canaxis.com.au. That's C-A-N-A-X-E, a double S, dot com, dot A. Are you? Thanks to Inclusive for Design 24. And does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Ross, so much. That was a that was a really great talk and uh, clearly laid out. And I have to say, you had me at is a screen reader able screen reader user able to finish the workflow? Because honestly, that's that's why we're all here, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and better yet, uh, saying that actually we need to have real people be doing the screen reader testing. I think quite often with screen reader testing, we get too much into the weeds of, of the technicalities of, of this and that, and we forget the, about the screen reader experience that, uh, that people have uh, uh, accessing our content. So really, thank you, I love that. Um, Sarah, do we have any questions? Yeah, um, to start off, a uh, question from a, a listener. Uh, I was wondering, you went over a lot of like the importance of testing a lot of different screen readers. Um, I was wondering if you had any particular favorite combination that you use to just get a quick initial impression um, or if you, if you do that at all. With me, uh, I've always found Chrome and MVDA works, works well. Uh, uh, that's my main uh, go-to uh, combination. Uh, the worst experience I found is using IE11 and also uh, Le Legacy Edge. So those two browsers always uh, seem to give really bad outcomes. But uh, I, I personally, I found MVDA and uh, Chrome always uh, give a very consistent result and a good outcome. Makes sense, yeah. And hopefully, hopefully, I eleven will be finally going away <laughs> soon. When it's officially dropped from one support. day. One day. <laughs> um, yeah. Another one. Uh, uh, you talked a lot about um, like specific tests to do with screen readers, and I know like the results you get from you know various screen readers can differ a lot depending on 
you know, how you interact using the screen reader, like if you're in the right, like one mode versus the other on Windows screen readers, or like using voiceover commands versus just keyboard commands um, with voiceover. Do you have any resources that you'd recommend for someone to start to learn those, um, or just kind of to start to learn how to be familiar and comfortable um, interacting with a page with a screen reader? One of the best uh, resources I've used is from the uh, Pacello group. Uh, they uh, have a resource of, of how to test with uh, iOS on uh, a voiceover iOS and a talkback on Android. Using that plus uh, pairing that with the uh, DQ uh, resources of, of navigating with JAWS and MV. Kidia. All of that has been invaluable for me. But what I found when initially reading it, there's so much information there that it was often over overwhelming. I've got links, I've got lists, I've got this and that. There's just so much to take in. So in many ways, that was the motivator for me to think, right, if I'm uh, testing what are the main actionable things i need to uh, uh, test for and that then led in to the resources which uh, uh, we, uh which i made so uh, 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 basically having a, a developer or a tester think right i need to test with uh um jaws i, I don't know what to what to test and then it's uh, basically a guide uh, 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 the test headings do this uh, turn on the the screen reader this way and that's been uh, a really good consistent way of how to help others understand how to test awesome. and i think i found the tpg article you mentioned so i'll uh, i'll try to tweet that out, out on the id24 hashtag um, after Great this stuff. talk unless you want to <laughs> or both <laughs> or more both of us I think <laughs> a little bit <laughs> yeah um so another question uh like once you've found an issue uh do you have any recommendations for the developer once they found it and they um th their markup is valid and accessible or at least they think it is but it's still not being announced correctly do you have any recommendations how, like what to do at that point I would say first that um uh make sure it's it's an actual uh, coding issue. So uh, 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 testing it in a range of uh, browsers and assistive technology. Uh, are, are those errors which you've noticed in one occurring everywhere else? If it is, then it's most likely a coding issue. If it is just in one instance of JAWS and say, uh, uh, Firefox, but overwhelmingly it, it it works everywhere else. Then that would indicate that it's most likely not a not a code issue. So having that workflow first helps you then think right. I need to you know, dedicate time and effort with looking at a fix versus it's okay. You can you can. I possibly ignore that so it's working out first is it occurring everywhere and then if it is it's it's a, a much more intensive work of working out right this is an issue which occurs everywhere what is the error and then a, a, a deep dive down into the html code working out what's going on yeah, I think that's a great point. Like at, at some point, if it's going wrong everywhere, you're going to have to invest some time in it. Very much uh, so, yes. Do we have time for one more question, do you think? Probably squeeze one quick one out, yeah. Cool, awesome. It. Yeah, I really liked your approach that like a very good like minimal, like baseline is if the text is on the screen, it should be announced by the screen reader. Um, do you have recommendations for what sort of, like how to tell what sort of other visual information should be announced? Uh, like contextual information, like if, um, you know, a caption is next to an image um, and they're visually grouped, do you like, or, or like you have a, a 
card pattern or some other like visual grouping or like contextual information just based on cues that aren't textual. Do you have uh, recommendations for developers for how to tell like when that sort of information should be explicitly announced by a screen reader? Interesting question, because um, I guess uh, I've always been uh, focused on uh, the outcome of uh, 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 is uh, the visual output uh, being out out to put it and I guess um, uh, there would need to be extra uh, a test around if there if there is an image with uh, uh, with a caption is that linked uh, some way and I guess uh, that would be uh, another uh, another protest working out what the next level of things uh, to test are so this could be this methodology could be described as a very quick uh, surface surpass and you would then look at a, develop, a developing extra extra tests are elements related uh, correctly if if there is an image and a caption is that link so uh, i think that uh, that scenario would would lend itself more uh, to further tests are being developed. Awesome, always more work, great. Fantastic, thank you so much Ross and thank you Sarah. Um, if you like this session, you know what to do, hit that YouTube like button uh, or better yet, share the session. And don't forget you can subscribe to youtube.com forward slash inclusive design 24 to be kept in the loop of all our future events and to catch up on any talks you might have miss, missed this year as well. A reminder that ID24 is a respectful community and you will find our code of conduct on our Inclusive Design 24 website. So Inclusive Design 24 is brought to you with uh, huge thanks to our supporters in Topia, Fable, TPGI Arc, Adobe, Tetralogical, Intuit, Infoaxia, Center of Inclusive Design, Web Directions AAA, Adrian Roselli LLC, and Can Access. So we will be back at the top of the hour for our very final session of our 24 hours with the wonderful Jared Smith. Uh, and uh, we hope you can all make it. So we'll see you in just under eight minutes. <laughs>